And one of my earliest publications in this area, perhaps only my 10th autism related publication, set in motion my approach to autism research. That article titled Toward a Behavior of Reciprocity, published in 2006, questioned the core assumption that autistic people are impaired in reciprocity. In that older article, I reminded readers and myself that reciprocity is by definition a bilateral phenomenon. One dictionary defines reciprocity as, quote, a relation of mutual dependence or action or influence, unquote, as exemplified by the classic reciprocal promise, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Another dictionary definition of reciprocity specifies that reciprocity is, quote, a mode of exchange in which transactions take place between individuals who are symmetrically placed. That is, they're exchanging as equals, neither being in a dominant position, unquote. But when I read the scholarly literature and when I listened to researchers and some clinicians and even some parents talk about autism and reciprocity, it seemed they forgot that reciprocity is bilateral, that it's a relation of mutual dependence, that it occurs between individuals who are symmetrically placed, who are equals with neither being in a dominant position. For example, what was initially called the Social Reciprocity Scale, published in 2002, contained items inquiring as to, the web, as to whether the autistic child is regarded by other children as odd or weird. Now, to me, it seemed that this item measures the lack of other children's social or emotional reciprocity, not the lack of the autistic child's social or emotional reciprocity. Regarding an autistic child as odd or weird implicates the regarder, not the autistic child, as lacking in reciprocity, as does the item inquiring whether the autistic child gets teased a lot. How in the world the occurrence of an autistic child getting teased could be construed as a metric that the autistic child, rather than the child who teases them, lacks social or emotional reciprocity truly baffled me. And that, along with numerous other examples, was the purpose of my article titled Toward a Behavior of Reciprocity. I wanted to remind researchers, clinicians, parents, and everyone that reciprocity is a two-way street. Similarly, my article asking, does the autistic brain lack core modules, published in 2005, also challenged widely held assumptions, in this case, the assumption that autistic people lack core brain systems, systems that many researchers have stated makes humans human. That's right. Researchers have claimed that autistic people lack neural systems that are uniquely human. How would you like to be described that way? I know I wouldn't like to be described that way. Do you think the researchers who have described autistic people as lacking basic core features that make humans human have thought about how autistic people might feel to be described that way? If not, perhaps it's those researchers who are the ones who lack reciprocity. Just a thought. In 2005, I also published in the journal Science an empirical review of numerous studies demonstrating that autistic children do not have deficits in forming attachments with their primary caregivers. Those who claim that autistic people lack social and emotional reciprocity often bank on the assumption that autistic children have abnormal social and emotional connections or attachment to their primary caregivers, but that assumption is demonstratively and empirically false. 